Hello, Brian. Hey, Mark. How you doing? Good, you? Good, good. I am looking forward to another episode today in uh, the therapy shed. Yep. But uh, just while we're setting up, have we, uh, I'm just thinking, should we have a little bit of a reflection? Should we get our homework marked and out the way? Yes, our, our, our homework challenge. Have you done your homework or are you going to get uh, on detention? I have done it, I've done it. Um, it was, um, it took a lot of thinking, if that makes sense. I think, you know, um, the last task we got, which is a ground and task, something that I do anyway, so it felt um, natural, it felt normal. So that was from the Paul Mayne episode, that wasn't was it? Yeah, he, he got us through a ground and yeah. like a bodily ground and technique, mm -hmm. yeah. So this was from Nick, wasn't it? Yeah, Nick which was to find something that we do, maybe that was a, a ritual or a, a habit um, that we were aware of that we were then trying, go, trying not to do. So the one I ended up picking was, I always like to have the volume on the TV on it, even number. Oh yeah, you mentioned that, yeah. Okay, so you did it? Um, when I remembered, um, I have to say, I didn't do it every time, but there was a few times where I would put it on an even number and I'd go, ah, I need to not do that. Yeah, yeah. And I'd move it down to an odd number. Um, and it felt a little bit uncomfortable um, me doing it, I don't, I don't know why. Um, but I did do it, and once I'd done it a few times, it then just felt less uncomfortable and it stopped bothering me. Um, am I still doing it? No. Um, I don't know why. I'd like to have me volume on it on an even number but it doesn't have any negative impact on my life so that's probably why I don't need to yeah. worry too much about changing it but it was certainly interesting it was a, it was an interesting task to think about what about yourself very similar yeah and just listen to your talk there but I think as Nick was saying in, in her episode on OCD it was that challenging that wanting to control our the little bits and pieces about our life in any way we can and um, and trying to accept that uncertainty you know accept that we can't control everything so for myself, um, I did it, yeah, and I did uh, throughout the lockdowns, you know, throughout the pandemic, in and out of lockdowns, I've worked from home quite a lot, so I've been lucky enough to be able to continue working throughout uh, the, the pandemic, but as I say, spending a lot of time working from home, which I think for most people who've had that experience, there's been a yin-yang sort of relationships, part of it have been great and mm. maybe more time on your hands or a bit of a novel experience but then also that merging of your home and your work environment is not I found quite unhealthy and quite challenging at times but one of the ways that I've been coping with that I feel like it's been a coping strategy for me is I've I was insistent from the beginning on keeping this was just to myself that I keep my morning routine so I get up in the morning and even if I'm working from home I don't have to have the time of traveling to work and so on um but nonetheless i'm like right i'm going to still try and get up at the same time do my same morning routine so get up you know wash walk the dog um come home do me little you know maybe do do some yoga sometimes of a morning and then i'm and the bit the main thing that i was i was quite deliberate on quite intentional from the from the beginning of of covid and working from home was actually getting dressed as i'm going to work Mm. That was a big one for me. Um, and what I realised was getting dressed, and obviously I'm on Zoom calls working with clients quite often, so I'll be on online video calls and so on. But I was getting dressed as though I was going to the office, and that was a bit of a coping strategy. I did find it really helpful. But something I realised, certainly once Nick asked us to find a bit of a of a ritual and that we could challenge is, I was always wearing um, my shoes. Right. Now, I'd never wear my shoes in the house normally. Mm. And yeah, I was always wearing my shoes and I thought, imagine, okay, so I'm just gonna use that. And I just used that as a bit of a, well, don't don't wear your shoes, still get dressed as though you're going to work and, you know, you know, do your job as normal, so to speak. Um, but don't wear your shoes around the house because you wouldn't normally. And you know what? It was challenging. It was, yeah. an, interest, it was an interesting little bit of homework to do because I just, and like yourself, <laughs> I have gone back to, wearing my shoes or at least wearing some you know some footwear shall we say because uh, it's just comforting and it doesn't it, you know it, it doesn't um, hinder my, my my life or my mental health in any way but just challenging that little ritual of thinking I would never wear shoes in the house normally this is clearly a coping strategy something that I've associated with feeling okay about working from home is to actually put my shoes on as well just changing that one thing trying to challenge that little 
ritual, shall we say? Yeah. In a way, I really did. I found like a it extended my empathy, my level of empathy with people who were struggling with OCD. So uh, it was interesting, interesting piece of homework, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. It was really good, and I'm I'm glad we done it. It was um, it was insightful. It, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was good. Shall we get ourselves set up? Another, Let's go. Another round. Let's go. Let's do it. Hello, my name is Mark. Hi, I'm Brian, and welcome to the Therapy Shed podcast. Thanks, Brian. I'm doing all right. Good. Another episode. Another episode, indeed. Here we are, back in the uh, back in the shed. In the therapy shed. I've been, in, I've been in it all week. Have you? Not sleeping in here. Sure. I'm sure you don't live in here. I'd live in here if this was my shed. I must say. I would sleep in here now and again. I do have a nap. But Does anyone come looking for you, or worry where you've gone to, or is it, does the world know where you where where they'll find you? If you need to find me, this is where you come. <laughs> See, that's been my uh, that's been my perspective with you since I met you. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Just busy. Good. Um, looking forward to today's um, today's podcast. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. Another episode with uh, a special guest. Yes. Uh, so, shall we introduce our special guest? We shall. Without further ado, thank you very much. We are honoured to have Kate Henderson. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Kate. Thanks for inviting me along. You're welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. A little bit nervous. Uh, It's it's all good fun. Good. Once once we get into it, hopefully you'll feel less nervous. I think um, all the guests that we've had on have said the same. You can feel a little bit on the spot, can't you, at first? But hopefully as we start talking, it'll just feel like three friends. Yeah, I can chat to you too. Yeah. Forever, so it should be fine, I'm sure. Don't Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and that was part of it. Lock the doors, it's yeah. going to be a good one. <laughs> we, we've had um, many conversations, haven't we? For, we have. Um, I think we sat next to each other for a while, didn't we? We did, we, we did. We did yeah. talk a lot about lots of different things and yeah. used to help me a lot as well um, at that time. So, lots of nice memories. Yeah, good, good. So, um, before we get into our discussion shall we say today as with all of our guests Kate we are we ask uh, 10 questions which in the first series Brian and I answered um, and they were questions from which were really interesting really. I think a lot of people the feedback of the podcast so far listeners have said that they found it quite intriguing you know just kind yeah. of the the questions are quite cool with insight and a little bit of thought and maybe think questions that we may not have thought about may, may not have you know pondered on yeah without being uh, without being asked so are you happy to answer some questions for I us? Am. we've got 10 questions yeah so no rush um but are you ready i'm ready let's do it okay kate so question number one what is your favorite word so i'm gonna go with yes because i just think People should say yes more to things. You should just be saying yes to things and experiencing things. And if someone says yes to you, you usually it usually makes you feel quite happy. So I'm just gonna go with the little word yes. That's a boss little word, isn't it? I've never even thought of it like that. But what one of the things I, I follow, I don't know if you've seen the yes theory of, of just saying yes to everything. It's like on YouTube there's a bit of, like a bit of a um what's it called, a bit of a group. That, okay. That do is it, Yes. I've heard of it, but I've never seen. Is it is it good? Yeah, I'll check that. Out. And what's the film with Jim Carrey? Is it Yes Man? The, the this, yeah. yeah. And I I just think um, as I get a bit older, now I'm in my forties, coming up to forty three soon. Um, I haven't really got many regrets, uh, but anything, any little things that I do regret, it's things I've said no to instead of yes. So ah, now I just okay. think yes, 
and it's a great little word. And that's why you said yes to coming on the podcast. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like it, Brian, like it. Sweet smoker there. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so question number two. What is your least favourite word? Okay, so least favourite word, and can I only have one? <laughs> got two that I'm stuck between. We'll go um, go with two, can I go with yeah. Tim? Yeah. So firstly it's got to be now, hasn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's got be the opposite, you know, to, yes. opposite yeah. to yes. Um, but actually even worse than now I think is can't. I hate the word can't. And I hate it when people say to me I can't do things. Because if, you know, if someone tells me I can't do something, like in terms of I'm not capable of it or something then I'm just going to work that much harder to make sure that I do do it oh, so it's a motivator for so you it's a motivator yeah. but yeah. also like when it comes to children young people I think it's it's a real that word is a real barrier but yeah. and, and it's something that they hear a lot definitely um, so I really dislike that word yeah me too that was mine on my like, was it yeah, was yeah, it like, for yeah. very similar reasons yeah, yeah definitely yeah. particularly I'm sure we'll come on to this in in the uh, the episode today, Kate, but particularly working with young people as well, I'd imagine that to be a very um, powerful word. Yeah. For maybe not not always the best reasons, maybe quite destructive reasons. Definitely, and it's good. it's just going to hold you back, isn't it? If you think can't, you know, um, naturally I'm going to try and problem solve anything that comes along that uh, I can't, and um, I, ju- I just I, I find it really restrictive. Um, and you know it's not nice language to use with kids at all yeah definitely fantastic okay question number three what turns you on so i thought about this one a little bit because obviously i'd listen to you and then i just thought you know what it's got to be people hasn't it <laughs> it's got to be people for me because i just love people and i just love meeting new people and um working with people and helping them and helping them to overcome things and um, so yeah, for me it's just people and I think I've always been like that since I was younger and um, just I find people so inspiring um, and, I ju- and I I think like in terms of people, there's not very many people I dislike um, in, in my life. There are some who I come up against but I think um, I, I'm, I'm a people person, I mostly get along with, with most people who I meet whether, whether I like them or not or they're my type of person. Yeah. Um, but even those people who I find challenging, I always think, what can I learn from you? <laughs> what can I learn from you? You're, this is going to teach me something, and I'm always up for learning. So I just, I just love people. And I think pe- people are, I find with people, you, you, you know, you, you draw energy off each other, don't you? You can recharge each other. You can sometimes it can be done in an opposite way where you can feel quite drained by people, and that's something that you know you need to learn to, to sort of manage. But I definitely feel I get charged off of the around certain people. Hundred percent. Like I don't know whether you've read um, Vex King's book. I think did I talk to you about this in the past, Mark? It's called um, Good Vibes Only, um, and yeah, it really. talks about vibrations and about people who higher and lower your vibrations and stuff. And I think something that I've learned a lot uh, during COVID is to put some boundaries up with certain people yeah, people yeah. who were taking more from me than they were ever giving me anything back you know and mm. um, but that it took me a long time to kind of make sure that you know obviously I want to I want to do things like altruistically but at the same point I've got to make sure that I'm not taking advantage of because because I have got that nature that wants to help and mm-hmm. mm. um, so I think that's something that's probably come with age for me to be able to make sure that you know I give uh, what, but I also need to make sure that you know people don't take advantage of that mm. within my nature. Mm-hmm. 100%. I think in therapy work as well, quite often in, in my experience anyway, I'm talking with people like yourself who work as, in therapy, <coughs> excuse me, with therapists, boundaries can be a pivotal kind of yeah. thing to, do, to explore and develop with the clients, you know, the, Definitely. The, the, the way they relate to their boundaries and how valued they are. With the boundaries, yeah, just definitely a hundred percent. Everything you say made sense. Then. And I just think, with it, like, in my life, I've got like mentors. Like, I don't know whether you've read Russell Brand's book on mentors as well. So, I, there's people in my life who have either been. So, for instance, um, I'm really good friends with the first head teacher who, who took me on, um, like, for a permanent job, like probably nearly twenty years ago. She's a really good friend now. 
and she's mentored me throughout like, my life mm-hmm. <laughs> but the times where I've mentored her as well like for because obviously I've this thing you know we've got a friendship now so there's different you you, you, you get different things from your different friends but um like I've had a lot of people who've seen potential in me and who've who've kind of given me opportunities if you like and so I like to do that for other people as well and I think that's kind of like you know we were talking about pay forward or before like if, if if you've got something to offer then you should offer it but it's really good when other people have done that for you as well and that's being modelled yeah definitely, definitely. brilliant good answer okay uh, question number four what turns you off oh turns me off I think it's probably got to go back to the word can't <laughs> And um, you know the word no and um, blocks that really you know people who just who, who block or stop progress or uh, um, you know don't allow you to fulfil your potential really turns me off. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna really struggle with that. Um, so I, find, I do find I, I come across that from time to time, um, and rudeness as well. You know, like if people are rude or. Yeah. They're not coming back to you if you like, um, because that, I suppose in in like me work and life, that does annoy me. That really, if people don't come back to you, it's like that feels like a block because it might stop something from being able to happen. And I think, um, everybody's busy, aren't they? So, but you you do you all respond like you respond to people within, you know, a certain amount of time or whatever. So. Yeah, people who people who kind of get in the way. Right, <laughs> they really, okay. they really <laughs> turn me off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question number five: What sound or noise do you love? It's got to be like the kids laughing. <laughs> yeah, like you know, um, and even more so, I suppose when they were little, that sound of just like giggling like I had my nephew for the d- a day a couple of days ago and he was just giggling he's only 18 months and he was giggling and giggling at this dog in the park and yeah. um but yeah when I, I've got three little kids so you know when they're not fighting <laughs> and I can hear them playing and they're just laughing and I just think it's the greatest sound yeah yeah it's just so innocent isn't it especially yeah. with, with, with children like even I mean even adults laughing it just it, it makes everyone else smile doesn't mm. it even, even the words make, makes you smile I think doesn't it but definitely yeah. when, funnily enough when I was thinking about my favourite word I was I was thinking about laugh and smile they, they're definitely up there as well and I, I do think in terms of like therapy you, you need to you know when appropriate uh, use laughter and, and use humour as much yeah. as possible oh, with people yeah. and get people laughing yeah. it can be a real um, like building block for relationships can't it for the therapy work is that you know building that trust through sharing a laugh you know sharing that sense of I remember I think we said this in an earlier episode uh, Brian that I heard somewhere once a comedian or a comedic writer I forget who it was now um, but they said that laughter at its core when you laugh you're actually allowing people to see your your true self, your actual self, yeah. yeah, you're vulnerable. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I always comes back to me when I, when I, when you know, whenever we talk, when I talk to somebody about laughter, is that yeah. sense of we're allowing ourselves to be free and I suppose vulnerable as well with another person. That can be a real 100%. relationship. Do you know what? Hundred percent. I was just thinking about um, a young person who I'm working with at the moment who's thirteen, who just looked so fed up, and um, you know. She, I'm working with her on mood, behavioural activation, but she just looked, fe- that was the word I could describe her, mm. totally fed up. Now, yeah. I'm working with the parent alongside, and when I, when I saw the parent this week, she said to me, we've got laughter back in our house, mm. we're having fun, Fantastic. we're doing things together, That's we're fun, laughing yeah. to hear her yeah. laugh, and she said, I didn't realise like how much all that stuff had stopped, mm, you know? Yeah. And she said it's just joyous in the house because we're, we're laughing together again. And I thought, you know, that's progress, isn't it? Definitely. Thanks and for sharing. Yeah, I, I, I think just on, on that, because it's just come to my mind, which we'll probably get into as we go into the episode. But even when I do couples work, you know, often I'll say to couples, you know, learn how to 
laugh again and yeah. enjoy each other's company 100%. and have fun and enjoy each other's time and, and things like that. But that's the whole point of being in a relationship, isn't it? Just, isn't Definitely. It? Okay. Question number six. What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, well, I'm going to have to go with... <sighs> So I think I've spoke to you about this in the past, Brian. You were going to give me some hypnotherapy once, do you remember? It's the, I, I, I'm not a very good flyer, and so I just hate the noise, or I hate any noises connected with airplanes. I, I just, it, it frightens me, um, just hearing the noise. Although I've got better since i uh, done my CPT training, because I've realised that it's, I get pa it's panic and it's a misinterpretation now that I, th I think I'm gonna die when I hear these noises yeah. that you know like oh the wheels coming down or oh, the wings or whatever mm -hmm. and it, I just all oh, think oh I'm mm -hmm. gonna die so mm -hmm. any noises connected with airplanes I don't even like them flying over my house because I think oh, it's gonna fall out the sky or yeah. something mm -hmm. so I've got a little bit better but I still I still don't like the noises of airplanes. <laughs> Yeah, that hypnotherapy okay. session. Yeah, definitely. Tell, it's tell been yourself out on the podcast. <laughs> Disgraceful, shameful. I mean, happened. luckily enough, we've not been able to fly anywhere for the last 18 months due to COVID. It's <laughs> <Yeah. so. laughs> a COVID I'm strategy, fine isn't now. it? Yeah. Or avoidance. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, question number seven What is your favourite swear word? This is Brian's favourite question. Can I be to really ask. naughty with this? You can oh, yes. say whatever you like on this <laughs> podcast, Kate. What is your favourite swear huh. word? Um, so it's got to be cunt for me. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be, and it links to loads of those questions earlier about, you know, what turns it off and stuff like that. It, I just think it's the word cunt. Is you know, if I've used that word, because I give people a lot of chances, you know what I mean? So if I'm using that word to describe a situation or something that's happened, then I'm really, really... Is that you with, that you with ten, I'm at, it, yeah, using that word? Yeah, right. that's right at the end. Yeah. So I do, but I do love that word. Yeah. I do love it. Yeah, it just, yeah. There's a power to the sound of that word as well as well as the. I think I think your word was the other word, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was indeed. Yeah. So uh, yeah. so it's not me. It's probably my least used word. Yeah. Um. So if I was gonna go with a word that I use a lot, it's fuck. Yeah. But under my breath, and then say to the kids, you "Okay, darling, what would you like?" <laughs> <laughs> I like my, I like the way your emotional management. But under my breath, I'm going. <laughs> Yeah, it's my it's it's my favourite question on those questions, but I don't really swear a lot. Yeah. But I think it's because when when you do swear, it, there's often meaning behind it, or there's a passion behind it, isn't it? Or you know whether that's frustration or joy yeah. or whatever. Um, it just enhances the feeling of, of how how you're feeling. Yeah. Um, Which is why it's my favourite, and I'm just at the end of me tether if I'm using that word. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Question number eight. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Oh, do you know what? And this is something that I've always thought since childhood is, uh, I'd love to be a photographer if I was going to oh, do something right. else. Okay. Um, and yeah, I just think catch the moment, you know, those little snippets of time. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of my favourite things. I don't know if I've got the patience to kind of go away and learn it now, but I definitely enjoy. I haven't got a camera, only my iPhone. <laughs> I haven't got the equipment, but I just I do really enjoy taking pictures. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Question number nine: What profession would you not like to attempt? Oh, um, what wouldn't I do? Hmm. This is a hard question for me because, as you know, I like to say yes to most things. So. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'll pretty much have a go at many things. Uh, what wouldn't I do? Hmm. Well, I wouldn't make a very good hairdresser. Okay. <laughs> but that's not saying I wouldn't like to be one. But I'm just not very good. I'm not very girly. I'm not very good at things like that. Um. So I don't think I'd have many customers if I was a hairdresser. <laughs> I think I'd be, they'd all be going somewhere else. I'd be, I did cut me, uh, me, all three of my kids' hair in lockdown, which didn't go well, any of them. <laughs> so I'll probably okay. stay away from that one. <laughs> cool, okay, hairdresser. Real. Uh, and final question, Kate. Question number 10. If heaven exists, 
What would you like to hear God say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? I like this question. Um, I just think it, it would be nice if he just said, come on, welcome, welcome in, come in, and you've done a good job, thank you, you know, and just to know that you've, you've, you've had a, a good life. And that you've, you know, you've you've made a difference. Mm. And you've you've left something behind for others. I think. I think that's a great yeah. answer. That yeah. yeah. Well, I bet you. I like when you, the words you used when you said you did a good job. Yeah. yeah. And even come in. It's quite quite. Yeah, good. yeah. I thought that the first yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I'll pro- I'll just be glad that I'm going upstairs and not downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because as, as, as you know, as I'm up there, I don't care what he says to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I can be quite naughty, so I'll be glad if I get if I get upstairs. <laughs> Yeah. You're at, at the moment, so there's yeah. a little bit of a, your journey so far. Yeah, of course, yeah. So, um, so as you know, I'm a CBT therapist and also working with um, education mental health practitioners as a supervisor, so developing their practice. So I've been doing this similar role for about 18 months. Um, prior to that, the year before, I retrained as a CBT therapist. Um, which was just the best year of my life. I absolutely loved it. I had the best time ever. Going back to uni at 40 and being paid for it as well. It was fantastic. Um, and I got to meet you guys. Yeah, and I worked with... Um, I worked with... I worked for White Pass, obviously. Um, I don't know if you had to mention White Pass. But, you know, for me, that was fantastic that year. I had always wanted to work for a charity. Um, so I, prior to that, um, for about... For five years, I worked in the local authority in a number of different roles, but the main role was education officer for the Safeguard and Children's Partnership. Mm-hmm. So um, I had done a lot of multi-agency work there. I was on the CAMS partnership, and that was where I've, I've developed relationships with, um, you know, the colleagues from White Pass and and how I really I ended up taking that recruit train opportunity. But before that, and for about the first 15 years of kind of my career with children, I worked in school. So I'd worked in, I worked across 17 primary schools for a while as an inclusion manager. So that was kind of coordinating support for mental health attendance and safeguarding. And I was developing networks uh, with those schools at that time. And But previous to that, I was about 10 years in a primary school. So that's where I really kind of, got me grassroots, I suppose, when I was in that school, you know, I, I, I worked there, I, I'd done a lot of training in different thera- therapies at the time, so, um, but did nothing like the specific qualification, but I'd done like Quiet Place, I'd done like Relax Kids, um, done some NLP while I was there, and then just, I got really close, worked with some um, staff who I became friendly with in CAMS and they would give me supervision for my practice so I've done a lot of work with looked after children so a lot of work on trauma and at, at that time you couldn't really get support for kids who'd experienced trauma unless they were in a stable home I'm not sure if that's changed now actually but if they were you know if they were if they were moving around foster care placements or whatever you couldn't get support but I would get help from CAMS to make sure that you know I was able to support them as best as possible so that's kind of I'd say like nearly 20 years now working in education and very much started off kind of firefighting really just kids you know whatever they brought I would work with and then if I didn't know what to do I would go away and learn or I would signpost to other agencies um, and then just really develop my practice through kind of on the job if you like you know working with what what they brought and very much then because it was primary school was very involved with working with parents from the off and that's probably why now even regardless of the young person's age like I can only think of one young person I've worked with in the last few years where I've not worked with the family at their request um, 
I always work with the parents as well um, and, and often before we start with any therapy in case there's anything like you know regulating things in the home meal times bed times sleep gaming um, family routines and stuff like that boundaries before I'll even move into therapy and I learnt all that through being um, just being on the ground in a primary school and, and just working with what people brought to me sometimes that's that's the best way to learn isn't it actually sort of being there and that experience i mean i think going to obviously university and places like that is, is really good and you can learn all the theory but unless you're actually there doing it yeah um, I, you know, I think it definitely worked for me like to do to do all that practice first um it led me to think um, as I learned the theory, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is why it works. Yeah. People have already, I, I used to always think, oh, I could have wrote this because I knew I knew the practice. I always knew the practice first. So um, I would say probably about 15 years ago, I trained as a parent and practitioner in incredible years. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, that's one of the main things I still use. So even if I'm doing CBT for mood or anxiety or whatever, I'm working with the young person, I'll, I'll generally, be sharing some of the theory of incredible years with the parents alongside it and that's where I find I get the most impact and see the most change but even before that like before like working in schools and um, I, I just think and I mentioned this to you the other day from like 15 16 I always worked in pubs and restaurants and that was where I first kind of got me love of people yeah. from just working in pubs and restaurants talking to people you know having those little chats with people have you you know the, the regular customers who will come in they come in to see you because they knew what day you were because you'd, you'd, you'd you know you'd give them your ear for half an hour and and they benefited so much from that and i think that was probably where i started developing like problem solving type skills with them and kind of empowering people to make those change you know they would talk to you about things they wanted to change or whatever and you know i think i'm definitely I'm not a fixer in terms of fixing people's problems. I'm definitely more of a, I've always been a little bit of a goal setter and get and empowering people to kind of take steps to make changes mm. if, if that's mm. what they want to do, if you like. So working in pubs as well, I, can, I mean, I mentioned this on um, a, an episode we did in the first series, talking about my background and my childhood, and I grew up in, in pubs. Oh, did you? I, I didn't know a, that. Yeah, when I, was a young, when I was a little boy, yeah, my dad run pubs, so... Um, Brian and I had that conversation and I think working in pubs it really gives you a a, a good vantage point to be a people watcher. Hundred percent. Because obviously you whether you're behind the bar or whether yeah. you're kind of you're basically not drunk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not, you're yeah. Not, and you're not involved in the kind of social groups within the pub sometimes because you, you your staff or as I say you always live in there. Um and it just really fascinates me that because you, you as you describe yourself as a people person and that's certainly how I've always um, I've always found you, Kate. I just wonder, do you feel like that? Did that come from your childhood, from like working in so pubs? I think and, um, and it, it, an element of so, it, like, I'm one of six kids, so I've got five sisters. So my dad never ever got his boy. <laughs> <laughs> but although grandson number eleven is going to be born next week, surely, so. surely that makes sense. <laughs> <than myself. laughs> although he says he's too old to box with them now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Um, my dad, my dad was in the fire brigade. My dad's a real was a, you know a leader. He was a trade unionist. He was a, he was he was the trade union member for, mm -hmm. and you know I grew up with my dad, always fighting people's corner, um, it, through that role that he had. Then my mum, my mum's a, a little bit quieter than that, but she, but is quite she's a bit of a people watcher, but in the background kind of thing. And we, you know, I I was really lucky that I've grown up with a really solid family background with a lot of. Um, really strong values kind of instilled in me but i was really quiet as a child i think i was saying this to you the other day probably until you're not offended that i was quite shocked yeah when well, everybody no one ever believes me but i used to like be the last i'd be the one hiding behind like my dad's leg or whatever um up until and my mum and dad says they just couldn't believe it because i was a nightmare teenager the worst out of the six apparently i don't believe that though I but, <laughs> but i found my voice as i got a little bit older after being um really shy 
Um, and I think that was probably a number of reasons. It, I've got it. Like one thing I probably haven't mentioned to you is that when I was in primary school, I did experience really bad bullying for a short period of time, right. and um, I did move schools as a result of that. But also we moved house. But I think that my parents and still that to strengthen me when I went through that. So I would never then take any shit anymore. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's never happened to me again. But I think that one thing is that I, I do really empathise with kids around that. And I, for me, bullying is one of the main traumas that kids have in schools. And I just feel we need to do loads more on that on that subject. But also then, because my, my cousins have pubs and stuff, you see, so I, that's why I was working in pubs from an early age. And I think that just really boosted my confidence because you just had to talk to people. And uh, um, so, yeah, so that... Uh, that I, I think that I learned a lot of the practice which I then used with pet you know how could I when I was like in the early 20s with no kids do parenting strategies with parents you know mm. how could I stand up and do that now when I look back well, you know, sorry Katie to interrupt you I was just thinking in that, at that time were you were you nervous about doing that work like as you say engaging with a parent so um, it's understandable that most parents are quite proud of I imagine I, I imagine um, I was a bit nervous but I think my approach was always about the relationship even back then so I was really lucky that I had the head teacher who was fantastic who would say to me bring them in I'd make them a cup of tea you know get and uh, you know right. build the trust and stuff so naturally I wanted to do that but I was supported to do that by the head teacher and she saw the value of it and um, I can remember being nervous I can only remember one parent ever kind of challenging me on well, you haven't got kids and kind of saying to her that's true you know that is true and I'll probably learn other stuff but what I've got I've got I've got I've been practicing this for however many years at that time and it's backed by lots of evidence yeah. and all the families I've worked with I've had really positive feedback so if you want to be here and you engage in it you might it might help and she and she stayed and she did engage and that was the only oh, time I was ever challenged on the fact I didn't have kids at that time but like even just um recently i heard from um a couple of parents who are who were on my first ever incredible years course that i ran mm. and their kids are in their early 20s now and one of them passed out actually and i think he it was the army or he's the navy he joined anyway she was telling me about that but like when i first met her she sobbed in our session and her, she, her, her child was so challenging his behaviors and stuff and she stuck with it and we broke down those barriers and I've done a little bit of one-to-one with her first and she came you know she joined on the course with the rest of the parents and those two mums the, who contacted me recently have remained really good friends and throughout their whole life they've supported each other and their kids have they as they've grown up and they sent me like these lovely messages saying you know remember when we we done the course and we have to do role play in incredible years and that mm-hmm. and I apparently I threw the toy at one of them <laughs> I was being the naughty child you threw the toy at me and I didn't know what to do and stuff but I just thought how powerful is that like that's their whole like that's 15 16 years ago yeah. it built them a support network that they didn't have previously to that they've remained friends and they um, and it was about it was about understanding childhood development, which they didn't, you know, when, you know, boys at a certain age have a testosterone surge around four or five and they start pushing boundaries. And this parent didn't know, she wasn't a bad parent, she just didn't know how to deal with that, you know, and we, we learned that together. That was my first course. And um, her relationship with her son, you know, obviously it had her ups and downs, but it was fantastic. Now, I was lucky enough working in a school that I witnessed that because I saw him grow from that little boy who was in year one who was six to when he left and went up to high school and then he had younger siblings so I saw the benefit like I think as that's one of the things I miss in therapy um, as opposed to when you're a, a practitioner based in a school you see that whole journey and it's very rewarding to see that whole journey whereas when we in therapy you just see that snippet don't you yeah I'm always thinking oh what's happened to that one what's happened because I'm used to it. I, it, you know my long background was in school so you would always kind of see the journey of the child mm-hmm. yeah and it sounds like in, in that time it's, which I say when I work with with people and if, if the parents is you know you don't get an instruction manual do you when you become a parent 100%. a parent you just sort of you 
you, you do what you think's best and often that's from your own experience hundred percent how you were parents to those um children and um your own experiences and, and how you sort of uh, view the world and you know most of the time in other certain situations where it doesn't but from my experience most of the time it always comes from a place of love a hundred percent they want to do the best yeah. they want the best and they want to and they're trying to do the best and and it, it's really difficult isn't it you get you get you know i i make mistakes with my own kids and i have to sometimes stop and sometimes I'll contact, you know, I've got a really good friend who we kind of supervise each other, mm-hmm. peer supervision, and I'll be like, oh, can't get Rosie to do this. Or, and, and, and she'll like literally say to me, right, what would you advise if this was a mum? <laughs> mm-hmm. What would you advise the mum? Think about like the theory because the theory does work. And then I'll stop because I'll take the emotional attachment out. And then I'll, you know, I'll textbook it. Yeah. And it'll work. And that's the case. It works. It's, 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 it's as parents, you we're emotionally invested aren't we and what like we speak about in lots of episodes because it's so important that you know as, as therapists as practitioners as trying to teach parents in this case we're able to be a little bit more well not a little bit but we're able to be objective there's no emotion involved yeah 100 we understand the emotion that's yeah. involved but we're able to look at it practically um to then help and put things in place definitely i mean just trying to help people to parents to kind of respond instead of react yeah. is so powerful but it's really difficult to do especially if you've got you know there's many many complications within the parent's life outside of the child's life even mm-hmm. usually so um that's why um for me any any therapy with children young people always has to involve the parent because you know little small tweaks with the parents like that parent i mentioned before who said um about laughing again she said to me she said i've got no women in my life my mum died a few years ago i've got no women i've got me my husband and i've got my dad and the bro- she had a brother and and we were talking about independence this young person wanted a bit more independence and you know when it's that push pull yeah. as how much to give and she, and and not knowing and stuff, and that's all we've talked through is how you know she can have boundaries, but she's got it. You know, I always say when kids start asking, start listening to what they're asking. You know, if kids are asking for a little bit more independence, then find a way of doing it in a boundaries way that works for your boundaries, but gives them a little bit. Because otherwise they're going to start to rebel, aren't they? If they're not, if they're asking, we need to just stop and listen and think about it. Or become too attached. Um, and I think the, the other thing that just comes to my mind when you know you mentioned about working in pubs and restaurants, we mentioned in the first episode. I think when you work in that type of environment and you're seeing people coming in, you see them as that person. You don't see them as a mum or a dad or yeah. what job they do. Or yeah, you just see them true, yeah. as them. And I wonder if then you've taken that into the work that you've done where when a parent comes you see you're working with them as an individual yeah that's so true i'd not thought about it like that but definitely definitely seeing the person Mm -hmm. and that's my whole motto is um so although i am now qualified cbt therapist and use that model i am very much around can i work with this person in front of me do you know what i mean and if i if that connection's there and that engagement is there Mm -hmm. And then we think, well, what you know, what are your aims of therapy? Then, you know, I will work with that person if if we can, <laughs> because I'll see the person, and I get really good results with the with the kids and the families who I work with from following that. You know, because I I could never just go, oh, this they need this model. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and apply we're human beings, aren't we? You know, yeah. we don't fit in. We're complex systems as people, aren't we? So we don't fit into boxes. Uh, yeah. t- hardly ever but certainly when it comes to th- you know the, the role of being a parent and the dynamic of, of a family yeah it's not as simple as just you know follow this man as Brian mentioned before it's a slightly different point I think you were making Brian but as you've said before you know there's no manual with something as 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 complex I suppose as as, as big a role as being a parent is you yeah. know and it's similar with the therapy side of things isn't it there's no prescribed routes that you can just go just do that and you'll be fine 100 percent there's need uh, for me it's about right what are the needs here what are the needs of the young person what are the needs of the parents what are the needs of any of the systems around and how do we understand or assess what the needs are and then 
how do we then get action plan and get and get what what is needed to be able to make the difference so you know therapy will off if, if it's therapy alone fantastic because that's you know we might it might be just they need therapy and you know we're getting loads of kids aren't we i don't know who you might be the same um who've struggled during lockdown and now mm. for whatever reason it could be getting back into schools difficult i've seen more separation anxiety and sometimes it might not be separating from parents it might just be getting out the house as well um so that 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 they seem to those sort of kinds of difficulties seem to work really well with a therapy model but then sometimes problems are more complex than that and the needs are something for the child something for the school something for the parents and it's it's a more of a, a multi-agency approach yeah and i and i think just on, on that point that's why i i love therapy so much because there's so many different models that you can use yeah. it's not you know one person goes to therapy and if cbt doesn't work then that's it there's nothing you can do it's there's so many different types of therapy yeah. it's just obviously about finding what works for the right person and i think like you said just before kate about you know when you work with somebody you see if you're the right person for them and you, you know you can connect with them and build that relationship because if you can't then it might just be that for that particular person you're not that right person yeah. but there will be a person for 100%. them um, it's just about that person then you know yeah and sort of finding them i think we sorry but I'm, but yeah just off the back of that i think we discussed in early episodes as well haven't we that the importance of what you're describing there for me is almost like the litmus test of an, an ethical and you know recommendable therapist as well mm -hmm. if, they, if you've got yeah. a therapist who actually has that in their arsenal they've got the uh, um i guess the acceptance of your limitations and recognition of what you're you know what you're working with your your guide there for me is congruence you want someone yeah. at least yeah. a good level of congruence don't you think, and i the, think that i think it's choice with. as well isn't it like you know if if you've got if if you've got um a young person in front of you who wants to engage is willing to engage and you've, you've developed a good relationship and then they've got you've, you've come up with a bit of a plan of what you can do but then there's a choice isn't there they've got a choice of this is what i can offer if you if you want to because basically you're doing they're going to do the work aren't they it's them who's going to have to do the work you're going to guide them you're in a way and um, so you you go on the journey together but actually you're not fixing them they're choosing to learn to, with you mm -hmm. and to make the changes for whatever you know their aims are i suppose definitely and i'm just so what would you say is your the, the main sort of concept of the, the type of work that you do with with the parents and the young people and the children what, what what's the key elements so the key element of, of the any work that I do with anyone is about the engagement, is the relationship part first of all, and that takes a little bit of time, doesn't it? I I, I do um think it's a little bit more than assessment session one. I think it's a little bit of engagement and getting to know and building that relationship, yeah. and finding out what the aims are, what you know, what are they hoping to change and stuff, and then from that sometimes change can happen really quickly so i i struggle to put a number on therapy like mm -hmm. it could it could be that they need a long piece of therapy but it could sometimes you can do three four sessions yeah. and have a massive mm -hmm. amount of yeah. change yeah. um so for me it's definitely about the engagement but as i as i've kind of become a bit more established as a cbt therapist because obviously i'm quite new to cbt mm -hmm. but i would like you know i first done like counseling level two in 2006 and then incredible years around the same time and lots of other small courses that i've done along the way i think what i've become more confident in over the last year is definitely the fact that i am I consider myself now to be a multi-systemic practitioner mm -hmm. so um and that's where i think i get the results um because i, I work across whatever systems are important so it could be working with the young person and the parents and that's generally a, a you know a, it's definitely going to be the young person and parents as the first system but then sometimes there can be the school system as well or it could be looking at what other systems they're involved in so there, there might be clubs or it could be friendships or whatever so it might not necessarily be that 
I'm going to go and work with those systems, but I'm certainly going to be bringing them into the therapy to see how they're impacting on the young person. Right. right. So it's very much relationship led. Relationship led. All it's always relationship led, and as a result of that, like. I think contracting, we talked about contracting before, the contracting part is massively important to me. And again, that takes a little bit of time, doesn't it, to build that relationship, contract with them. And But I know that I'm really good at it because I get really good results with the young people I work with, but also I get very few cancellations and DNAs. So even in the summer, you know, um, the, I'm not, I'm not get, I've had one cancellation this whole summer. And then, um, you know, I want to work with the staff who I supervise to teach them how to do that because people people come to me and they're complaining, oh, I've had loads of cancellations this summer and stuff like that. Now, I don't know what it is, but I've I've always it's always been the same. I've never really got cancellations and DNAs, and I think that is to do with the relationship. But if I was working purely going straight into the model without building that relationship, mm. then I don't think it's. I, it's the investment that they've got in the relationship. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, and I think when, you know, if you're being taught, um, for example, my, my um, main teaching was in person centered and then I've done CBT yeah. and, and, and others, but it's all about the relationship. And, you know, for sometimes for some people coming into therapy, that therapy session could be the only real meaningful or positive relationship they've ever had. Yeah. So, you know, all my clients that I see, I, I similar, I try and um, really emphasize and work on um, that building that relationship because it is core, I, I, I think, to, to any therapy. That, in my belief, I mean, I know there's some people with um, who do CBT um, who say, no, it's the model first and then the relationship, um, where I, I, for me personally, I, I always think it's, it's the relationship. Yeah. And I think this is where, in the likes of schools and stuff, it, um, a lot of young people can struggle because those relationships can be very rocky, can't they? And I, 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 I think there's a, a saying um, about you know a teacher, for example, can either make or break a child. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's just about the relationship. It's not about how they teach the, the child. It's about the relationship they have, um, which is something that I unfortunately then have to work a lot with with children yeah. to try and unpick. And, the, and like just even like if you go into that even more i know from a few years ago i was working with um john moores and done some teaching on the teachers the teachers were that were just about to qualify and they, they invited a couple of different cams practitioners in about three four years ago and a few of us went in and delivered different things to these newly qualified teachers and it but they were they were we were like the last it was a full day of mental health stuff and we were the last like um teaching that they had before they, they mm. qualified they, you know they were done then and the feedback all of those teachers said was we should have done this at the start of the course and yeah. we should have had more of it and we should have had more of it and like i've got some really good friends who were teachers from my whole career in education and um funnily enough i was chatting to one of them um, recently um we were just chatting about various different stuff i was telling her about you know going to going off to teach and i chill myself and stuff and um and she and she said to me you know you taught me so much kate about the relationship with the child and she said i would never have known that and and she 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 used to she was quite strict and she could be a little bit harsh at times and like i just you know maneuvered her a little bit to it <laughs> so we've done a lot of circle time because it was primary school and I used to make the teachers sit in the circle and join in and some of them really didn't like it but yeah. I was like well sometimes kids don't want to join in yeah. so now you know how they feel yeah. so you know if, yeah, if you're going to be in my circle you need to be in my circle otherwise you're going to have to leave the room because you're either in or you're out you can't yeah, yeah, yeah. um so stuff like that but I think there's a lot more you know I think same as parents that you know teachers and staff in schools they want the best for kids but um sometimes systems work in isolation and it's i think we need to move massively towards this multi-systemic practice 100 percent. because there's, 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 again that, that other saying isn't there which i love is that um i think it's so many years of education but nobody ever taught us how to love ourselves mm -hmm. and, and i think in in schools i mean you know it should come from ho at home as well yeah which often yeah it yeah does. but i think in schools there should be a lot of emphasis on how to um 
be aware of your mental health, how yeah. to respect yourself, how to love yourself, how to... I think it's coming about now. It's getting better, through the, You know, obviously the green paper and all the transformation mm-hmm. plans, but also, in a way, I think, hopefully, hopefully, I'm hopeful that COVID has done some good things for that because we've become massively more aware of how young people have been um, impacted mm-hmm. by COVID. Um, so, you know, I am hopeful. There's a lot of move around it, but it, you talk what we're talking about is changing whole culture and ethos of yeah. schools. Mm-hmm. So you need a buy-in at a high level, you know, so we can go in and deliver one-to-one or even whole group stuff. But if that is not lived and breathed every day in the schools, yeah. Yeah, and it is something I'm really passionate about. So I'm chair of governors in the school. Don't know if I've told you this. Yeah. Um, and we and and we're an amazing school and a, a part of an academy. Six six schools in the well, about to take the seventh school, and you know our culture and ethos within that school. The school I'm chair is actually one of the other schools. It's the school where I worked for ten years. You see, so I've I've kept that relationship. I didn't want to be a governor in that school, but I went to a partner school, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. because and you know we we very much are doing a lot of re- relational practice where staff are taught even just things like we, we shared something on twitter last year around the greetings that the teachers do at the door so kids come in every morning and they can choose to either have a high five a hug or just say hello mm-hmm. so they so they're getting that contact at the uh, you know that um connection at yeah. the start of each day but they're also getting choice because not all kids like hugs and not all kids want to high five mm-hmm. some just want to say hello so um yeah so so it's really it's it's lovely to be involved in these schools and see the way they constantly develop and practice. Yeah. And it all comes back to those relationships, doesn't it? Po- forming positive, healthy relationships 100%. with, with um, you know your, your peers and yeah. um, again sort of you know teachers and people in that as children we see as sort of you know leading us and guiding us, um, whether that be teachers, parents. Yeah, like so in our in the school where I'm chair of governors, we have a no shouting policy. So no, the, you never hear a, a school, you never hear a member of staff shout at a child. Now we've got a blueprint for behaviour, and it follows. I don't know whether you've heard of Paul Dix, but Paul Dix does a lot of all this behaviour management in school stuff. And um, but then they they interlink that with like trauma informed practice, and you know just constantly keeping up with um, the the latest research on on what's working and stuff so the reason they don't need to shout is because they'll have a relationship with that child so you know they they do have um consequences um, and sanctions but they are they are spot on behaviors at the responding to need at an earlier point to get mm. the to get the young people back on track you know obviously it doesn't work all the time and sometimes kids need something additional but it work it does work uh, really really well and I just think the minute you shout you lose don't you you lose that child I mean don't get me wrong I'm not perfect to lo- lose my temper with my own kids sometimes yeah, course, but yeah. if you shout it's the rarity if they, if, if they get shouted at in our house and if you shout then you've gone into f- you've gone into fight or flight mode yeah, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, and the other yeah. person the kid yeah. is just lost because they're thinking oh what's happening and then you just end up getting into a battle don't you so and it's a, I think it has um as Brian mentioned as well, it's that sense of the child, like your child, and obviously if it was in school. Because I think it's important to mention, like teachers can often be very undervalued, and there's obviously, of course, there's a lot of pressure on, on the role of, a, of teachers. They're all, and they're doing the best to increase the standards, yeah, yeah. which is ever, you know, more and more pressure all the time from officers mm-hmm. of so many different things you've got to do. But I do think it goes back to that teacher training. You yeah. know, teach this Definitely. right at the offset, uh, 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 teach it as part of the curriculum. Definitely, and like you said, I think you said you know at the, it needs to come from like the top, doesn't it? It's not about the, the teachers putting more work on them. It's about changing how you change the whole system. I, I spoke to somebody um, a few weeks ago actually who said they go into school and, and to do stuff around mental health and teaching, but what they have to do when they go into school, another lesson will be cancelled, and it's often PE. So something that's really important, like physical education and PE, yeah. that'll get taken off yeah. for that person to go in to then teach about mental health and mm-hmm. you know wellness and things like that. But obviously, what part of that? There's an element of that where they'll be talking about the importance of physical activity. Yeah. But the physical activity they should be doing at schools being cancelled. It's kind of mixed signals, then I would <laughs> guess for the children, isn't it? Because you're like, well, I'm trying to take myself. If I was a six, seven year old in that in that situation, everything. 
What we should have been doing PA this afternoon. I'm listening but to it's, you. Do not it's so hard, do you know, like it just it's so in terms of like timetabling for these things. Yeah. So yeah, like yeah. it's so hard to meet the needs of the child and the school and everything we're trying to do because you know if you if you take a if you've got a young person who's got who's anxious for any reason and you take them out of a subject English or history maths or whatever mm -hmm. then chances are they're gonna worry that they're missing that subject yeah. as well yeah, yeah. so and but you can't take them out to playtime or lunchtime because they're gonna miss the social aspect mm -hmm. And then you think, well, PE art or whatever, but then the, that, there's an element of, you know, that movement's important, yeah. enrichment's important. Stress so itself. it's so difficult, mm -hmm. like it's for schools to manage all of this stuff. It's just, it's so, so hard. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some schools who we work with, fantastic, take them whenever you need them. But then, you know, I had a young person say, well, the parents, it was a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't one of my, it was one of the ones I supervised. And, um, They've, she'd been giving them lovely, ta you know, home tasks, but like you know, really nice things because she's very creative to take away. Well, it caused the child lots of anxiety because she was going back into class with a folder, and all the kids were going, "Where have you been? What have you got?" Yeah. And mm -hmm. and that was yeah. So, but how do you get this right? You know. Yeah. That's why I, I, for me personally, if I could um, have a magic wand, or if I was in charge of the whole education system, I think I would probably look at prioritising mental health and well-being because I think if somebody is being able to be the let's call it the best version of themselves so they're feeling really content relaxed yeah. happy um, you know in, well, in a well-being sense feeling really well I think they would be more engaged in learning yeah, so potentially 100%. you could have slightly just for example like sort of slightly shorter lessons which would then allow time mm. to fit in. There's a school I know of um, that every, the start of every lesson, they do a couple of minutes of meditating or, or grounding right. um, before That's they good. start the yeah. lesson, before they go in, before they go out to play time, yeah, do yeah. meditation and then they yeah. come back. Um, and what they found was it, it um, behavior sort of um, reduced. It, it reduced yeah. their, um, almost like productivity like exam results and yeah. stuff all went up mm. and the only thing that they changed was introducing this mark these yeah, mindfulness really practice good. yeah yeah um, and they've they done it as part of a pilot because they've done it in yeah. prisons and they've done it in um, i think i've heard about that before it sounds stuff. really good and um, the, the results were, were really but it's whole it's whole school approach isn't it and that's the thing isn't it like there's definitely a, a place for one-to-one -one therapy mm -hmm. but there's also the, an element of just the whole culture ethos within the school yeah. leads you know if how how the staff feel is going to impact on how the children feel and you know having those opportunities to kind of celebrate difference and encourage tolerance and identity and relationship building and stuff across the whole school yeah. is just so massively important isn't it with the teachers mental health and well-being being looked after and they're yeah. feeling again the same yeah, yeah. quite calm relaxed enjoying going into work enjoying teaching then they're going to be able to offer the best version of themselves to, to the, the yeah. children that they're teaching and then the, the children are feeling the same mm. way and it's the, it, bring, it brings it back to parenting doesn't it as in if a parent is feeling good if they're feeling well mentally yeah. you know, and physically but you, you know um, if they're taking care of their own well-being and sort of self-care then they're going to be able to be a better version of themselves oh yeah 100 percent 100 percent it's just all cycular isn't it if mm. that's the word cycles and um, I, I think with parents the importance of building up the trust with the parents in terms of the systems and getting to know a little bit about the parents and their experiences and stuff as well you know because mm -hmm. often you know if you've got a young person who's got having a negative experience with school for whatever reason a lot of the time you'll find that it, possibly the um they've the parents has experienced something similar yeah. to the chat, oh, you know, like yeah. it previously. So you, to build back that trust well, is really just, important. It's interesting you say that. I was just going to ask you, Kate, in your experience of all the years you've worked with in schools and around schools and with families and, and obviously young young people, children and young people as well, something, something that was just playing on my mind then was, because I've got very limited experience of that sort of work, what are your 
What's your approach and what would you say your experiences have been working with? We use the t- we often use the term of like resistant families, and that's not obviously said in a in a, a critical or a negative sense. It's just families yeah. from, from many different reasons are struggling to engage with support or struggling to actually to um, respond to, to to support. What what's your kind of um, What's your approach to that as a professional and obviously your experiences of that? So well? as an education professional, I w- how I would approach it would probably be different to now being an NHS professional. Right. And that's only because of boundaries within work. Okay. So when I, when, I, when I was working in education, I would be very much in that home, home visits to build up that relationship. So it would be about getting to know the family, getting to know what's happened, really hearing their story and validating it. because. The school might have a different perspective on what's happened and why you know the, it, the it, it's probably going to be emotionally based school resistance you know they'll call it school refusal but it's not it, it, it's a, a reaction isn't it to, to what's happened in the school system so i would be going into the family home to build those relationships to find out what are those barriers and then to look at it can it be rebuilt with the school with the existing school which is always the first thing to do because the more we move skills schools the more it can be a resilience building factor but it can also be really damaging because they've got to start again and then uh, that you know they may feel like well i was the problem i had to move and stuff like that right. so you know i, I it, it's just about really finding out from their perspective and validating and sometimes that's enough you know mm-hmm. just to validate what they're with the yeah and understanding that this is your experience of what happened this is how you viewed it what mm-hmm. happened and you know then really just putting some small steps in place to build a, pa- a plan to get the to get them back into school if that's the goal it's mm-hmm. got to be their goal though if that's not the goal then you've got to look at what what else you can do because if the goal is not to get back into school then you can't work on that, can you? Because it's got they've got to set their own goals, if you like. I appreciate this might be a, a, a broad question, but in your in your time working with with children, young people, in, in particularly with school, uh, sorry, and families, particularly around school, um, do you have do you feel like more often than not it is that um, successful? Shall we say that families and young people are engaging and they do see positive results o- overall? In terms of like resisting kids who are yeah, out of yeah. school and getting them back into school, are we, are we yeah, talking about specifically? Yeah, there? I think, yeah. I'm, I think I'm, that's where I'm, I, I'm at when I. Yeah, so in, in terms of m- from like my own personal experience, I've got a really good track record of getting getting kids back in who, who've, who've been out. So I've got a young person who I'm working with at the moment, and um, he's 17 and he hasn't been since the start of COVID, and he's got he's got complex health difficulties. Um, which he, there's no reason why he can't be in school but obviously that's in COVID has compounded his anxiety yeah. because he has got health related difficulties mm-hmm. uh, but um, we've been working on a behavioural activation but working very closely with his mum but I'm also working closely with the school and um, when I saw like this young person you, like a lot of people would have just been really he was very disengaged to start off with shall we say you know it took couple of sessions to even get him to talk to me and see me on his own without his mum but in session we had, we'd done a session um, just come back from a week's leave last week the session before we looked at values and we couldn't really pick any values but we ended up getting like four or five really good values which included being able to get a job so what you need to get a job I'm going to need an education he's always dressed really nicely so I was like you know a clothes important to you so yeah I want to be able to wear nice clothes and and you know oh, well, what about where are you going to live well, you're going to need a house eventually else and all those things and then when he came back last week after a week's break he, we agreed that in our next session which is on Thursday we're going to make a plan and he's going to go back in September now it's going to take a little bit more work because he's got to get through that barrier mm-hmm. but where it was you know if I had just took it on face value it looked like it was to do with his anxiety increasing due to his health and the worry of COVID and all those things but when I really unpicked it with him in that value session what was the hardest thing was seeing everybody after not seeing anyone for 18 months yeah. so that's the bit that yeah. now 
what generally what I would do with something like that in terms of transition is you would start them with, with um, you know, introduce them to a smaller group as a start. But he doesn't want that because he doesn't want to be seen as different. So he he needs to be thrown in at the deep end, and he's right. recognised that in himself. So we've still got a way to go. Um, third of September, but it, we, you know, like you know when I said before about sometimes therapy's long isn't it and sometimes it's short yeah. but when I first met this young person I was thinking oh my god I'm going to be working we're going to be working together for months and months and months to make any progress but we had a light bulb moment in session three and it feels like things are just going to speed right. up along now but it's because I've met him where he is at yeah. you know um, and got to know him and I haven't assumed I've asked him the questions even though it's been difficult because he's quite re he was quite resistant until he's warmed up a little bit too. <laughs> Come the, I said, your aim is just not to have to see me anymore, isn't it? And he just laughs and he's like, I said, oh, you hate coming to see me. That comes back to <laughs> the, the sharing laughter with someone that yeah. we mentioned at the beginning of the, the, beginning of this episode. Yeah, yeah. You share that. Yeah. You know, sense of humour, joke. Because you can open up a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Because he'd been so isolated. As a family have come, he's the youngest of three kids. The family have come to not expect him to do things so he's withdrawn from eating dinner together going out for meals when you can and you know walk go in the park or anything so working with the parents as well i've been able to kind of support to say no you've got to push him to do these things you know you've got to engage in life you've got to engage with your family like life is about people isn't it yeah. you, you know whether or not he's going to finish school or he's going to get a job he's got to find a way of engaging back in life and so very quickly they put little things in place and it's made a difference and he looked like a different kid the other day when he came in it was just lovely to see oh thanks for sharing that kid that's really a brilliant story i love that i mean when you said as well you met him where he was the first thing that came to my mind was maybe he's never felt like somebody's done that yeah, that's what for I a good thinking. long while maybe ever you know actually you're validating him as a person aren't you? And, and we all I have that so. experience that yeah. meets us where we are in that that's, moment that's, that's the whole idea of therapy again especially Absolutely. when I work with, with younger people it's about meeting them on the same the same level you know respecting them exactly the same way um, th that you would anybody else and then often again in school for example that doesn't happen because the teacher would see themselves which they are in, in, in a sense as the authority figure so it's like you know this is my classroom you do as i say type, type of thing yeah which which there's an element they have to that to, to manage the, 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 yeah. the classroom if you've got different kids in it mm -hmm. and even as parents it's like well i'm i'm the parent so you do as i say and you, you know things like that where i think when a, a young person comes into therapy for again a lot of the time it's the first time that an, an adult has met them on the same yeah the same level yeah because well, it like I, when 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 i when i took when i started working with them and obviously the school's goal was get them back into school get them back into school i said right we're gonna we'll have we'll have any hat if we if it's needed so an early health assessment tool we'll have a multi-agency um meeting because there's health and there's education and we've got um mental health and physical health needs so just we'll, for, sorry okay just for Anyone who's listening who may not be aware, an EHAT, that's the function of an EHAT? That's yeah, so it's well. it's basically coordinating support when there's more than one agency involved in, in a child or young person, family. It's a family it's an approach to make sure that, you know, people aren't working in silo. Um, so it was it's an it's an opportunity to get all those professionals around the table to with the young person, and the parent, to create a plan for needs. Um, so you know there's a need that there's a need for this young person to get back into school um, because you know he's got he needs to be doing something he needs to be engaging in life but he needs to finish his education or you know think about career um the future and stuff like that so so what we done was um we arranged to have the the e hat the uh, edu um early help assessment um, where all the agencies involved with this young person would come together and you know he would have some input to help plan for his future and then aside from that um, I would deliver his therapy but the school wanted the goal to be to get him back to school but I was really clear with this young person we need to find out what your goals are what do you want from this right. therapy and um, and it was hard at first we could you know we, it was really difficult to come up with goals and we did get some um some some short-term goals so one of them was 
to read every day because he, he he wasn't reading and he had loads of stuff and he was a really intelligent um mm. young person um and then there was another one about getting out the house because he thought he wasn't leaving the house much at all and um, but long-term goals we struggled with but when we got to that session three he just realized that his goal was to get back to school and he set that goal for himself now oh. i couldn't you know i wouldn't i i if i had to enforce that goal on him it wouldn't be powerful and it wouldn't be meaningful for him and um, but it, through the through the first few sessions and our discussions around you know his values what he wanted out of life all those things he was able to clearly identify actually yeah i do want to go back to school and it's going back to school is not going to be as hard as going to college or doing something else and so you know fingers crossed we're going to make a plan this week and it's just, it sounds so, and I know we've used this word quite a few times in this episode, but it's such a key component of therapy, isn't it really? A key component of relationships is y y empowering, yeah. empowering, particularly with young people, I feel. I was, of course, as you mentioned, Brian, you know, all three of us work, um, have worked and continue to work with, with children and young people. And I think that is such a, it's one of the key tenets, isn't it, of any work with yeah. children and young people is empowering them. It comes Definitely. back to what we said before, Kate, meeting a young person on their level, where they are in their life, what's going on for them in, in their, when I say background, like in the, whether it's a family home or the friendship groups yeah. and so on. I think to helping them find their voice maybe, like sometimes, and I don't know, I, I feel a lot of things, a lot of mental health difficulties and I'm thinking more around like moods related more so than anxiety mm -hmm. but I, um, it can be anxiety as well but I think um, things often start with a feeling and they don't understand that feeling and so they might have other thoughts as a result of it but I think with especially with younger children they get it's a felt sense first of all mm -hmm. so when you when you're working together if you can help them articulate what it is they're feeling or why they're feeling like that and then you know start from that point of view because it's really confusing isn't it you know i know as an adult if something's upset me but i'm not quite sure what it is i can be in a bit of like a mood all day where i'm thinking oh I'm really pissed off today yeah, of and i don't know what it is yeah. so for for a for a child or a young person to feel like discombobulated if you like mm -hmm. that was going to be another one of my favorite words i love that word <laughs> and to not so to work through that with someone who's non-judgmental and who's just going to listen and help you kind of figure out what it is it might be about you know what you what your needs are what you need what needs to be met <laughs> to make sure that you know you're getting what you need if you like mm -hmm. um i think that I, to me that's, that's therapy really isn't it yeah definitely understanding the feeling and understanding what, what what's going on understanding why you're feeling something or thinking something and trying to make sense of it and yeah. how that fits into your your world. And I just love, um, I know we're finishing now with me in a minute, but you know, of all the CBT tools, I love the um, the figure of eight. Do you use the figure of eight oh, much? Oh yeah, yeah. I just, I, it's so powerful for, for like all relationships, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I just think to sometimes I have to CBT myself <laughs> and he, I use that and think oh what, what am I responding to here what am I you know what am I feeling and um, you know if you think if you use that and alongside like thinking errors and thinking traps and stuff like that it's really powerful isn't it because um, of, often we might be perceiving something that's totally not uh, the situation yeah. so, what, see, sorry go I'm just going to say off the back what you're saying there please. like CBT. That's what the um, we say the founders or, the, or like Ellison Beck and, yeah. and Judith Beck is daughter Alan Beck's daughter and so on. That's exactly what they would say is a CBT CBT therapy should one of the key points it should lead to is that the clients and of course in this case in, in this case like children young people become their own therapists. Yeah, exactly. That's a key part, part of CBT is that you're empowered. And it's key part of therapy, I think. Yeah, it's not just yeah. specific to CBT, is it really? Um, but yeah, that empowerment, you actually, as you said, Brian, you know, you learn to build a relationship, <laughs> talk about relationships, build a relationship with your thoughts and yeah. your thinking patterns and your, and your emotions as well. Um, and that can be such a, such a powerful 
definitely you know, process for you to develop as a person i certainly found that and i continue to now just that self-therapy can work wonders, yeah you know? definitely yeah, we, all, we all need don't we at times mm-hmm. we need to be able to understand why we're feeling and think on something and, and reacting as well but i'm just going to say kate just as a very briefly can you explain what just because you mentioned it yeah yeah the figure eight is as a, as a theory yeah so in terms of the uh, do you know what i don't actually know who who, d- who developed the, f- the figure of eight? I've always just called it the figure of eight, but it's basically if you've got an it, like if you turn the number eight on its side. So if, if you're familiar with CBT or not, basically in CBT, to simplify it, we, we're going to look at thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and the cycles and for what, Im- how they impact on each other and for which part we you know can we change a behavior? Does that impact on how we feel? Does that impact on how we think? If we, if we work on thoughts, does that change how we behave does that change how we feel so if you had t- two people so for instance it, you know it could be like me and my husband john and i if we've got two of those cycles of thoughts feelings and behaviors next to each other i don't know if i'm explaining this very well yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i so let's let's just give an example like um so i might think um don't know. I'm 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 thinking what I can say now about my husband. Not giving too much away. I might think. Is he going to listen to this? I know, he might do. He probably will. <laughs> yeah. Um. I might. I don't. I don't know. So, say for instance, he, my husband has gone the match or something, and he's thinking, oh, we've won. I'm gonna go and have a quick pint, and he's feeling great, isn't he? So he he might text me, and I might have cooked the tea. It'd be it'd be a good day if I've cooked the tea. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> I might be thinking, oh, he's won. Oh, well, I, you know, I get a bottle of wine. We'll have a nice tea. I'll make a little fuss of him. He'll have a nice night. So my behaviour is I'm, I'm cook, getting the tea already. Now he's had a pint, and he might think, oh, I'll just have another pint. I'm going to leave the card and have a couple of pints with the lads or whatever. I'll just text Kate and we've totally misunderstood each other so i'm i'm getting us ready to have a nice night together and he's thinking oh i'll just stay out and have a few pints and so we're going to end up probably having a row at some point because we haven't understood what what each other person and there's been a breakdown in communication if you like because if he'd have texted me straight off and said oh, i'm going to go out with the lads i wouldn't have started planning to cook a nice tea does that does that make sense yeah i think that's a great example <laughs> yeah that's... so just thinking about in terms of your own this isn't what happened yesterday by the way he did come straight home from the match <laughs> he did come straight home um, we had family over last night but um but yeah it's just thinking about so if how how that could have been avoided if that if that was a real situation that caused a row or ends up with us having a fallout is that we could have before he went out we could have communicated what our plans were that that evening you know should we have a nice tea together or should you know should go to mark's so and get something in for tea and then he would know <laughs> he's only allowed to go for one point <laughs> <the match. laughs> yeah, yeah. but um yeah it's just it's really useful so i'm just thinking about how so working with a young person a couple of years ago now who was he was 18 19 at the time having lots of rows lived with his grandparents we used that cycle loads to look at how his behavior impacted the in in the family home and 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 he was able to re- where he was just really annoyed with his grandparents initially and um, because he felt like they were really restrictive on him they were kicking off when he was coming in at certain times and all that sort of stuff he was able to reflect using that process and think you know they're trying to look after me you know I've, he'd, he'd lived with them for a few years they, they're quite elderly and he was able to really alter his behavior which was quite negative in the family home as a result of understanding their thoughts and feelings um, and i always encourage um depending on the age of the young person i'm working with but you know i will show parents that as well or i with that young person uh, he actually went away and showed his nan his, uh, and they they worked they looked at it together and looked at different situations and it was really powerful mm-hmm. I, I think for me that that whole kind of um technique and using the figure of a process i think it just encourages empathy and reflection doesn't it Hundred percent. Um, which of course is all and all even just looking at different it, it encourages it to look at different perspectives doesn't it you yeah. know um i've used it again with another family when i was working on um separation anxiety young person was 14 and been sleeping in a mum's bed since she was eight and there was a trauma behind it there was a reason why but um we i i were before we before we, we used a bit of a phobia um 
you know, like a great exposure but, um, to get her back into her own bed. So she, we used like a reward chart and she'd done it so many days and stuff okay. like that. But before we got to that point of being able to do that, we used, the, I used the separation, I used the figure of eight with the young person and separately with the mum and then I brought them together and we were, I can't remember now the specifics of it, but they were, it was so powerful because they were, so the mum, the child thought that the mum would be scared if she didn't have a daughter in the bed with her and she was so used to it. And the mum's thoughts was, was she getting her own bed? So I watch telly in bed on my own, watch yeah. my own programmes. But it was, we it was done through, that was done through relationship. It was a little way into the therapy and I could work them with them both separately and then bring them together. And then the young person almost felt like she was keeping the mum safe because yeah, yeah. actually the, the being there'd be a mum taken ill in the night when the child was eight and, it, and then she'd have to call an ambulance. So there was a trauma behind it, yeah. but actually it wasn't a trauma response. It was kind of habits that had formed yeah. over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, we used that model and then, do you know what? I thought that would take months to get in their own bed. Within two weeks, she was six nights in her own bed That's with a okay. movie night once a week. It, um, and, and like you said, it's it's it's, it's funny and all things can just sort of yeah. come together when, when, when we least expect them. And again, I think the, the sort of, the, the, that's, that's the word I'm looking for, I don't know, but I think the, the main sort of point of all of what we spoke about today is the importance of relationships, whether that be relationships between parent and child, relationship between therapist and client, relationship between schools and the pupil yeah. and vice versa. And I think you know, I think people listening, if they if they can sort of take away from this that, you know, the importance of relationships yeah. and maybe just thinking a bit about the relationships that you have with, with different people and how maybe you could Yeah. One one thing I always say is because parents will often say to me, Oh I'll, I'll talk to them and I I'll say, Don't listen. Listen to them. Don't yeah. don't talk. Just listen and try really hard to meet them with quiet and just listen and reflect back what they say yeah. and give yourself time to process because I think that's so powerful, isn't it? Mm, yeah, definitely. And it's, like, it's, it, it's not listening to reply, it's, it's listening to understand, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, like we said at the beginning of this, we could probably spend another four or five hours easily um, talking about everything that we spoke about today. Um, and, and possibly um, in the future. Um, I think we're going to say this to all our guests, aren't we? <laughs> I think possibly in the future, come on for... You're on a, you're on a rolling contract. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Come on for a second... Um, yeah, I'd love to. A second, a second. I've really enjoyed myself and it's gone fast, hasn't it? Yes. Absolutely. It's been fantastic, Kate, honestly. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming in yeah. into the shed. Um, it's just really been enlightening and... So really enjoyed just, just before we wrap up, just want one more thing. Yes. Um, what we're doing is we're asking all our guests that come on to set us a little bit of a um, challenge or, um, I, I don't like using the, I say this every time I say it, but I don't like using the word homework. But, um, <laughs> but a homework. Homework. <laughs> um, we weekly task. A weekly task. <laughs> a weekly task um, that we can do. So obviously thinking about CBT, you know, yeah. like, like, you know, we, we give clients off and we give them tasks to go away and try. So just something for us to go away and try and then we can try it every day for a week and then maybe uh, what we will do is on the next episode is chat about how we found it, if it was helpful, if we were able to stick to it and um, what we got from it or what we didn't get from it. Um, so yeah, does that, does that make sense? It does make sense and I was going to give you one but I thought of something different so I'm going to give you a different one now okay. that links a bit more Ooh, to CBT. Like <laughs> links a bit Keep more to CBT, here, okay. So basically what I'm going to ask you to do is um, notice your thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. okay. um, so each day if you can try and notice maybe if there's some unhelpful thinking or if, if you know there's some feelings that don't feel too good and what I want you to do is just write that basic um, thoughts feelings and behaviors and just just write down a couple of what the thoughts are the feelings and the behaviors and just do this every day and then see if you can notice if you get to a point where either you can do something to change your thoughts or your feeling or your behavior so it might be so i've done this recently on myself and i noticed that when i was when i was annoyed and 
something pe- like in my personal life, I suppose, I would get into really unhelpful thinking, and I, I didn't realise, but I was checking my phone all the time. And I, so I, j- just do that for a few days, and then see if there's anything that you notice, and then think about whether or not it, which it works for you. Does it work to tackle the behaviour, the thought, or the feeling? So if it's if it's the behaviour, you can look to do something different with your behaviour. Mm-hmm. If it's the thought, then you're gonna maybe do a little bit of positive affirmation to mm-hmm. change the thought. And if it's the feeling, maybe again, you know, what could you do to to change that feeling? But then it might be helpful as well to get a sense of which one out of the thoughts, feelings, and behaviour causes you the most difficulties. Yeah. Have you got an idea which one it is? I'm already racing away with this. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And it's, and it's uh, I suppose CBT 101 isn't it really yeah, it's, yeah. Um, which, which is good and again it's probably something that I've not done on myself since I trained in CBT because yeah. obviously when you're training you, you, you do all of this to show mm. that it, how it works but um, it's, it's probably been a good couple of years since I, I've, I've actually um, d- d- done, done it on yourself. exercise and done it on yeah. myself um, so that'll be interesting to see um, how, how that goes yeah but, Quick. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you want to say? Or? No, just uh, thanks for me mug. I'm going to have a nice cup of tea after that when I get home. Thank you very <laughs> much. All of our guests get a therapy shared podcast mug. Yeah. Thank so, uh, you. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. Oh, Kate, it's been fantastic to see you and thanks so much for, uh, for joining us on the Therapy Shared podcast. We must do it again sometime. Definitely, yes. Thank you. And um, I think that's a wrap. Yeah. Good. How was that? Good, really yeah. good, yeah. Yeah, it went fast, didn't it?